this time on Watchers of Tomorrow, watch out for lasers! Hello everyone, welcome to Watchers of Tomorrow, the sci-fi review and critique show. Two podcasts, both alike in dignity and fair Verona, we lay our scene. I am Gepwin. I'm joined as always by my friend and co-host, Dr. Izix. Hi! And I, I was tempted to say something about roses, but I, I didn't come up with anything that fair. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't Okana by any other name smell as sweet? Uh, I'm not convinced he smells sweet, actually. <laughs> it's hard to say. So, probably. <laughs> All right, um... Yeah, so, we're doing uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we're doing that episode. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, to be prepared to be outraged in one way or another. Yeah, we, this is um, outrageous Okana, which is is a weird one off episode that people only sort of remember for the like Han Solo esque ness of the character. Indeed. And there's actually two other things going on this episode at the same time. Yeah, there are. And then, <laughs> but what what I think is interesting is just we decided to start doing this show a few years ago. We've been going through the things. We started coming up to season two. We get to the outrageous Okana episode, and then right around the same time that we're planning this episode and getting our stuff together, somehow every other modern iteration of Star Trek also remembers this episode. Yep. <laughs> and Okana starts showing up in a bunch of shit again. <laughs> well, that's a little awkward. Uh, yeah, so uh, how about that prodigy, eh? Yeah. I mean, it's it's fine. <laughs> Pro- <laughs> <a> prodigy, <laughs> overall. We need to do some, like, review series or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we could do the modern things, and then people might actually find us. Woo! <laughs> I just thought that was weird, because, like, if we'd started this show, like three months earlier than we did it would have been before all of these callbacks showed yes. up <laughs> so it's just interesting interesting timing that is correct yes uh, so it's uh, i guess fortuitous for us uh though other ways our schedule are uh, you know slightly awkward with uh, things and uh all that as well but you know that's fine <laughs> so let's see outrageous okana was written by david landsberg and Lance Dickinson and Les Mention, because <laughs> there's so many writers on this damn show now. Yep. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, also, also the teleplay was specifically was by Armus, uh, uh, Burton Armus. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so Landsberg has a long writing career. He co-wrote uh, the comedy detective school dropouts. Um, wrote and produced things like uh, Cosby, um, Herman's Head, and was uh, credited in The Love Boat, Fantasy mm-hmm. Island, all that stuff. Saturday Supercade. Uh, wait, no, he was voices, I guess. <laughs> uh, Dickinson <laughs> wrote and directed a film called Hollywood Heartbreak, which I've never heard of. And mention i could find no mention of hmm, well that's a little uh frustrating but uh yeah apparently this is like the only thing they worked on so meh. yeah <laughs> anyway. mean, we, we need somebody to help out <laughs> yeah and we have a cast we have way too much cast we have too many people in this episode yes. and even the episode agrees because Got they don't know what to do with them and two of them show up for like 10 minutes mm-hmm <laughs> But uh, I guess their time on screen is efficient? Question mark? Sort of. <laughs> so William O. Campbell, uh, credited everywhere else, has Billy Campbell. He tried to switch his name up mm-hmm. a bit. He plays Okana Thad- Thadden. I wrote this down and now I can't remember how they pronounced it or if they ever said his first name. Anyway. Thadian Okana. Yeah. Thadian Okana. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes, and uh, he's been a good number of things uh, yeah. since the 80s. He was well known for in the 80s for playing Luke Fuller on Dynasty, um, which was the number one show in America at that time. So pretty well-known dude. 
Yeah, so it's kind of a uh, a good get for the this, you know Star Trek here to have the guy mm-hmm. from Dynasty here. Uh, he went on to be in other movies and TV shows, like he was in Bram Stoker's Dracula, um, once and again. And he played my personal childhood favorite superhero, the Rocketeer, in Disney's oh, yeah. The Rocketeer. Excellent. Uh, I think he reprised the uh, the role uh, at some point as a voice uh, actor for, in yeah, a as new voice series. Actor. In this weird new animated series. The Rocketeer was supposed to spawn an entire film franchise. And I am so upset. (laughs) Maybe we can go back in time and uh, change some things there. We waited 30 some odd years and then got a weird animated show. Yeah. (laughs) Don't think that's quite sufficient for, uh, for our Rocketeer needs. No. The Rocketeer is the best, and even the like. The comic is so far removed from the yeah. from the movie. <laughs> Don't if you've if you've only seen the movie, look, find the graphic novel. It is uh, his girlfriend is not an actress in that one. And it's kind of jarring. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, couple other things that uh, Billy Campbell uh, has been in uh, was the forty four hundred. Uh, and uh, something uh, called uh, Crime Story, where he's in like 40 episodes. Yeah, he was around. He's still around. Yeah. He's doing a lot of... He's yeah. just... He's been he's been doing shit. He's in a Law & Order Special Victims Unit, which I think leads to what other person in this cast Who's has been in. Who's not? <laughs> <laughs> At this point, they've needed so many victims and perpetrators and side people. <laughs> like, I swear, every actor on Earth has been in Law & Order. <laughs> You know, uh, I guess it's surprising that we haven't been on Law Dark. <laughs> <laughs> I could be. I live in New York. I could walk through a scene. <laughs> <laughs> Background character number 58. <laughs> oh, he was also Abraham Lincoln in Killing Lincoln. Uh-oh. <laughs> hmm. Douglas Rowe plays Devon, who is known for supporting roles. His films include... Um, Apartment with Fear, and and some other stuff that I think my autocorrect ruined, because I've got <laughs> fear and th. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, autocorrect. <laughs> fear and thuthing in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and uh, he appeared in Murder, <laughs> She Wrote, in ER. <laughs> uh, mash, uh, you know, run till you fall to my daughter, Northern Exposure, e- yeah, he's ER, uh, uh, the Bullet of Time as Professor. Apparently he has several Professor roles. Hmm. No gross place. And now we've got Albert Stratton, who the character... I was just looking at this. I did spell this character's name correctly. Yep, it's Kushel. Kushel. There are like four stupid alien names in this episode, and they say them way <laughs> too damn much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which one of this was the person... Oh, oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> yep. He's probably best known for playing Tom Donnelly in the drama Love is a Many Splendid Thing. Um, he was also on the short lived The New Perry Mason, as well as uh, Quantum Leap and Baywatch. Yes. Uh, also, a, a little bit of All My Children, like, you know, 63 episodes, just I think like half a week of episodes, right? <laughs> I want to correct. I want to look. This like I'm complaining. I'm gonna, just going to complain about autocorrect all day today because in my notes I was able to translate it. But the new Perry Mason, which is a short-lived bad spinoff show, um, mm-hmm. got corrected to the new part Masson. <laughs> Masson. Yeah. <laughs> part Masson, the famous lawyer. <laughs> Fine. Uh, Rose, I've, I could do an entire podcast that was ju- that's just me reading scripts I try to write verbatim as the autocorrect <laughs> has has plays Mary Hobb with my with my dyslexia. <laughs> it wants us to suffer, specifically you. <laughs> All right, uh, Rosalind in in Gelu, in Geldu, I'm sorry, not not uh, pronouncing that right. Now Rosalind Allen, which is a lot easier for me to say. Yes, uh, in Geldu, yeah, yeah. No. Hail from New Zealand, apparently. That makes sense. Yeah, uh, plays Yanar, 
Canar. Yeah, from New Zealand, best Canar. known for playing the chief medical officer, Dr. Wendy Smith on Sequest. DSV or Sequest 2032. She also guest starred on Touched by an Angel and Home Improvement and Promised Land and a lot of other shows. And uh, was on Santa Barbara's Gretchen Richards. I've never heard of that show. Um, Karen Muldaney plays Benzan. Made guest appearances on Judging Amy, NYPD Blue, ER, Seinfeld. Uh, later comes back for the first seasons of Enterprise. This uh, picture here has uh, quite the haircut, honestly. It's a little <laughs> distracting. Yeah, now I need to pull this up. Let's see. Nope, that's not <laughs> one with a picture. They don't have a picture on Wikipedia. Hmm. Oh, wow, that is a heck of a haircut. <laughs> I wonder who he was on Seinfeld. I've been watching through Seinfeld. Hmm. Never saw Seinfeld Ooh. on the original run. I've seen bits of it on the uh, original run, but apparently played someone called Timmy. Hmm. Doesn't look familiar. I wonder what episode that's from. Anyway. Yeah, season four, episode 19, The Implant. Eh. I'll have to look at that. Oh, he's having the he was at the party. Okay. Fine. Anyway, this is not important. This is not important <laughs> at this time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh we got one more important person, uh uh, uh of course, uh, you know, our old friend the uh, the, the transporter chief, uh which doesn't have a name yet. Right? Is he even in this episode? Uh maybe. <laughs> because I have Terry Hatcher as the transporter chief. Oh, yeah. Terry Hatcher, Chief G, uh, B.G. Robinson. And uh, I just had her in here because she uh, is an uncredited transporter chief, even though she's now pr pretty famous. Mm -hmm. She was in Lewis and Clark Advent New Adventures of Superman and the James Bond film Tomorrow Never Dies. And... Desperate Housewives, Desperate which Housewives, is probably what she's yeah. most known for. 180 episodes. Wow, we was also in Night Court. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do have Thank one you. more person, though. Unfortunately, yes. unfortunately, we have one more person who is Joe uh, Piscopo, who plays the mm -hmm. comic, who was a cast member of Saturday Night Live and is now a conservative radio talk show host. Whoops. He was also in Law and Order. Which you can tell SVU. because he comes on this show as a comedian and he is not funny. Yep. <laughs> like, uh, I find these things hilarious. And like, uh, okay, uh, these aren't really things that are necessarily funny, like for any good reason. Uh, okay. I guess you just have your internal humor and just assume everyone else has it, I guess. And then he became a conservative. People didn't laugh at my jokes enough. Now I'm going to ruin America. <laughs> Why does this keep happening, Gepwin? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's. I'm. I'm sure people are surprised. We've developed this political bent suddenly. <laughs> Why are we talking oh, like this? Oh, I'm sure we've hurt so oh, many wait, people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, our, our viewers, do they not realize that we're like, you know, generally left of center of, of some various quantity? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> the two queer men who host a Star Trek podcast are progressives? How did that happen, Gapwood? <laughs> I don't know. Star Trek is such a conservative show. They're ruining it recently with all these wokitudes. <laughs> You know, uh, everything conservatives don't like, it's all over the new Trek. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw some people on it that weren't white. They were blue and, and things. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just, you know, outrageous. Yeah. Like O'Connor. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, he was in, you know, Joe Pisco was, in, you know, Saturday Night Live, uh, voiced the Pink Panther in the, you know, animated show, uh, and did other stuff, I guess. Yeah. I'm gonna forget yeah. about him now. <laughs> he was he was a last minute replacement for the guy they wanted. So oh, who'd they want? Oh, I had that an, an actual comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I had this here. Uh, uh, Jerry Lewis was scheduled to appear, but was unable to play due to a conflict with a guest appearance. 
I guess that uh, would explain the uh, the Jerry Lewis gag, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, just do a little rewriting and there you go. And uh, of course, this this can show you why it is absolutely right and proper for me to criticize him specifically as not being funny. Because um, Joe Hiscopo ad-libbed the majority of his lines. That will explain some things, yes. Yeah. So no, mm. it was not poor writing. <laughs> <laughs> just piss Joe Piscopo being I mean, bad at comedy. It was also poor writing because what the hell is this subplot? Mm-hmm. But not that's not the reason he's not funny. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I've gotten the general impression that uh, during that particular uh, uh, exchange there, that uh, while uh, Joe Piscopo is doing his shtick, you know, it's you know Brent Spiner's kind of making fun of him with his own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, you can kind of see that. <laughs> All anyway, right, we should um, give some context for anything we just said. Yes. <laughs> so the Enterprise is in the Omega Sagitta system. Or Sagitta. Hmm. I don't know. It sounds vaguely Spanish. <laughs> well, uh, uh, does this mean we're going to have Space Spain? Yes. Well, probably not. It's Space Verona, <laughs> <laughs> where we lay our scene. <laughs> <laughs> space verona that's more uh, italy but you know it's romance language it's fine <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's it's uh near venice isn't it i think so. yeah it's like you know venice is like the island and like verona is just like over yonder <laughs> yeah from ancient grudge break to new mutiny <laughs> or uh, as they say here there's two colonized planets in this system uh one was originally a colony of the other but after 200 years of separation they now have an uneasy peace hmm. an uneasy peace so uh where civil blood blood makes civil hands unclean yeah and, uh when do we get to the bit where people are like biting their thumbs uh that's i don't think they bite their thumbs in this dang it it's the best part <laughs> i know that's what we, we used to run around school because i bite my thumb at thee <laughs> oh there's the question that we all have to ask did you accidentally get the r-rated romeo and juliet in your classroom <laughs> <laughs> whoops uh i don't think so actually but because uh, <laughs> we did <laughs> there's 10 seconds of nipple and then the teacher jumps up and goes ah shit but it's too late that's the only scene they can't do anything <laughs> uh ignore that <laughs> anyway uh the ship has detected a vessel approaching it is years behind technologically it's a old worn out cargo ship its navigation system is broken the pilot's barely keeping it going they hail and contact Captain Okana, a Han Solo type, which I, I, that's probably what they wrote in the script. <laughs> yes. Uh, he even has the, a jacket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's all you know. <laughs> He's uh, got many quips. He's got a cavalier attitude towards everything. They offer to help and beam him aboard where he immediately starts hitting on the transporter operator, which is why they had to change out Colmini because it's too early for him to be a bi icon. Indeed. Alas. They could have had it, had the start right here, and we would have gotten uh, you know, much further along in that uh, you know, uh, long-running plot, but alas. So, uh, Worf confiscates his weapons. Wesley's interested in this man and his strange loner attitude. Because Wesley needs to get out more, really. <laughs> uh, he also starts up a back-and-forth with Data about the Data doesn't understand sex appeal. Because he's an android. A lot of stuff about uh, lying that will come up later. Akana leaves to have some fun with the transporter operator, you know, who we met earlier. Yep. <laughs> it's time for all the sex, but it's off screen, so mm-hmm. you don't get to see it. It's mostly off screen. I mean, yeah. the <laughs> sex is off screen, but we keep seeing the little starts of it, you know, as much as you ever get on TV. Yes. <laughs> the softest of soft core. So uh, Data is disoriented by Okana because he made some observations about how he has a lack of humor. So he consults with Guinan who agrees that Data doesn't really understand humor. This is quite funny, and Spiner gets to play Data (laughs) to really, really good effect because Mm -hmm. he is amazingly funny. He's probably the funniest character on the show. Yes. (laughs) Um, But I can't describe the humor here because it's, it's not translatable into, you know, synopsis so you know data's just being very good and funny in this episode yes <laughs> so just take that as a given and we can move on <laughs> uh Guinan suggests that data seek out help from a larger computer instead of a higher powder so um he goes to the holodeck and asks for a holographic comic 
Um, I don't know how they're measuring computer power here. Are they saying that the Enterprise computer is more powerful than the only sentient android in the known universe? Well, I think uh, Data's power is uh, in the, uh, the the way he can uh, adapt and learn, while the uh, Enterprise's computer is it just has more cores. So Data consults this terrible comedian with 500 years out-of-date jokes mm -hmm. about the basic theory of jokes and humor as an art form. Um, they don't talk about the theory of jokes or humor as an art form because there is, nope. <laughs> in fact, a theory to jokes and humor as an art form. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more than, you know, uh, tragedy plus time equals humor. Yeah. Um, they do manage to sort of skip over having to explain it because Data just sets the program to maximum speed and you get to watch a funny thing of the guy talking really sped up. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, do you know what he said during that bit? Because I, I, I'd be curious. No, I don't know if I am, no. All right. <laughs> it seems to mostly be something about, like, I have a cigar and I find that inherently funny. Yes, so I, I'm going to uh, jab my hand back and forth while holding it. Yeah. Uh, later, Data tries out the jokes that he learned on Gaiden, who informs him that he's spoiled it because, uh, you know, he delivered it badly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, timing is important. But then later he's called to the bridge, so we can't continue this horrible subplot. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the bridge. Yeah. Uh, they're being approached by a small ship that's locked lasers on the Enterprise. Oh no, whatever shall we do? For context, because they're very inconsistent with what lasers actually do on this show as opposed to phasers. <laughs> uh, these ones wouldn't even get through their navigational shields. Yeah, which is the uh, shields that they just kind of passively had uh, have up that like activate when they're going to run into like a bit of space debris or something like that. It's the thing that they use to explain why pieces of dust don't suddenly fly through the ship and kill everyone. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, this is just, you know, just basic protection here for tra space travel. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> so the ship hails them and starts leveling threats. It's kind of interesting to say the least because they don't stand a chance. <laughs> it's like, uh, why, why are you even bothering to threaten us? Come on. <laughs> so this is Devin. He demands that the Enterprise... Uh, prepare to be boarded because they are harboring a known criminal, Okana, and they want him now. Just then another ship appears. This is Kusel and his young son, Benzan. They are from the other planet, and they also want Okana. Yes, and uh, it should be noted that uh, which planet they come from specifically is kind of irrelevant, so don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from forth the fatal lines of these two foes, one might say. <laughs> so Okana is really popular. Uh, Picard's got no idea why they are here, but uh, he needs to do something because if they start attacking the ship, they might hurt themselves. Yes, <laughs> your lasers bounced off and like shot yourself uh, in the uh, the warp core. Uh, good luck. <laughs> uh, he sends Worf to collect Okana, who's in another crew woman's bedroom. Uh, when he gets to the bridge, Okana's confused why either of this party would want him because he hasn't done anything that he can remember. Uh, mm -hmm. They contact Devin to find out what he wants, and he pulls his visibly pregnant daughter on screen and says, Okana did this. Dun, dun, dun. Which, you know, given Okana's been sleeping around so far, and, you know, since the moment he got on the ship, that would kind of make sense, actually. So Troy urges caution, because a lot of people have these weird archaic notions about dealing with honor codes and procreation. Hmm. Yeah, we don't want a, uh, a repetition of Code of Honor here. Yeah, this this is interesting because one thing that this episode does really lean into is it is exceptionally sex positive. Mm -hmm. Is of course you can sleep with whoever and as many people as you want. We don't care. Everyone's just having fun. It's weird to us that people care about this whole you got someone pregnant thing. Yeah, and you know, if everyone's cool with what's going on, then okay. <laughs> you know, but you know, your dad freaking out about this, this that's kind of strange. So Picard decides to put an end to all of this and conference calls everyone. All right, gather around. So Kushal and Devins just start yelling at each other. Kusha claims that Okana has stolen a national treasure from them, the jewel of Thesia. So they argue about who has been wronged more until Picard mm. just turns the communication off. Yeah, Picard's figured it out. Uh, the uh, Jewel of Thesia, uh, only part of it was stolen, and then they replaced the rest, and they just kept doing that. And so now they're like, wait, the whole thing's been stolen, but he's not going to believe it. 
right? Yeah. That's how this works, right? Yeah, I mean, which one's the real jewel? <laughs> uh, so Picard takes Okana into the ready room to figure out what to do. Okana claims that he's completely innocent of the theft, and the other thing is really none of their business. Which, you know, they're like, yes, but this guy's making it our business, I guess. <laughs> He suggests that they just do what they set out to do in the first place and repair his ship and let him be on his way and he'll deal with it. Seems reasonable. Uh, we've uh, pulled this sort of, uh, you know, a plot line, uh, you know, together before like this. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, we'll just sort of give up on the situation and leave. <laughs> so in engineering, Okan is watching LaForge repair his navigational equipment, which gives Wesley some time to talk to Okan about being a loner and running off and not taking responsibility for his actions and how sad that is. It's like, I find you a sad man. And then it kind of goes, oh, a teenager finds me a sad man. Hmm. Whatever shall I do? Wait, I already used that line. <laughs> so it kind of returns to the bridge and announces his intention to surrender. The guard suggests that they beam everyone on board so they can talk face to face. They wind up in a conference room where Okana surrenders uh, to the more pleasant option, which is being married to Yenar, who uh, doesn't want to marry anyone. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, Benzan starts to protest, and everyone's very confused. Yeah, so uh, apparently there's more going on here than the dads led on, yeah. or knew about, or could have conceived of. So, the uh, party's fighting. Everyone's confused. They don't know what's going on, you know. <laughs> and then suddenly the comic shows up. Wait, no, that, that would have <laughs> been maybe some interesting plot twists. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It was really I. Yeah, the comic shows. I was like, I stole it. And I got her pregnant, even though I'm a hologram. It, yeah. The comic shows up. So a pair of star crossed lovers take their life. And then he, you know, pulls out a face and starts shooting people. It's like, I'm gonna make the yeah, I'm gonna make the plot happen one way or another. So anyway, uh long mess sorted out shortly. The child is not Okana's, it is Benzan's. He took the jewel to ask Yenar to marry him before his parents found out and tried to kill each other. Mm -hmm. Okana oh, no. just ferried them back and forth so that they could keep seeing each other, and he's been keeping the jewel safe for them, and he hasn't been able to deliver it yet. He was kind of, you know, on the last legs of a ship there, so, yeah. you know. Uh, Yanar takes a bit of convincing, but she does agree that she should marry Ben Zan because they've been in love for a long time, and, you know, it could mend their feuding houses and all that. Well, this is actually going to turn out uh, more pleasant than the end of Romeo One and Juliet. Hopes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is where we leave them, so... <laughs> so we don't quite know what happens at the end. <laughs> yeah, they're still all arguing about stuff when we leave. And uh, But uh, this time it's like, yeah, they're going to live on our planet. No, we're going to live on our planet. Yeah, you don't happen Arr. to have a brother who's going to kill someone's best friend, do you? <laughs> yeah, that, that would make things awkward. Uh, wait a moment. Maybe that's who the comic really is. <laughs> And the best friend, the be get when the best friend was comedy. <laughs> oh no, the real jokes were the friends we made along the way. <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> yes. So uh, Data then takes Guide into the comic so he can work out what went wrong. He adds an audience. Data tells jokes to the holographic audience, and they just keep laughing at everything he does because they're programmed to. And Data's disappointed that he can't do humor. Because there's nothing more uniquely human than humor, apparently. Hmm. Well, uh, I guess we can uh, keep uh, pondering about uh, this uh, data. And maybe you can find something else that's more uniquely human. I, mean, I guess this is before they'd done all the research about rats laughing and birds. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe there's other critters out in the universe that could find things humorous. So on the bridge, they send Okana off... Uh, Wesley tells Data to say goodbye, and he does the goodbye Data bit. He's either broken or doing it on purpose, because Data, why would Data not know what was meant here? <laughs> well, maybe he's just so twisted up by, you know, being disappointed in himself that, you know, he's, uh, you know, not operating at full capacity. Yeah. Um, Data is very buoyed by his success in the his, his goodbye Data joke. And so he keeps telling other jokes until Picard just just tells them to leave. Just yeah, just go. Just, just stop it. Yeah, we we need to get out of here. End the episode, please. Yes, just just go. Stop it. Right, we're done here. And so yeah, the uh, the outrageous Okana. Yeah, what did we think of this? It's it's uh, less tragic. I 
found it uninspired. Yeah, Romeo and good... Juliet is kind of just dull without the tragedy bit. It's just two teenagers yeah. who have sex. Yeah, and, you know, that happens sometimes. Get over it. And yeah, so the uh, I, I do appreciate that they wanted to have Data explore some humor. Um, how they went about it was a little head-scratching. I appreciate the Enterprise running into uh, space vessels that couldn't possibly, you know, threaten them at all, ever. Uh, and I kind of think in sci-fi like this, having that happen more often would be kind of useful for world building. Because that, you know, the, the Federation, you know, you know, is, you know, part of their sort of creed is we're not going to go around and stomp on people. So, you know, having people that are stomp as it were, uh, yeah, and they're just like trying to be nice to them, it's like, because that's the right thing to do, would be kind of nice to have happen more often. But, you know, we only got this occasionally here. Um, but yeah, the rest of it, meh. They really could have done something more with the comedy, because there's actual theory and art to comedy. It is an art form. Mm-hmm. Yes. You can do it well. Apparently not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it might have been hilarious if, uh, for the uh, the comic, they actually just had Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they could have done that. Pull up a historic comic. It's like, oh, Guinan's been around for a while. <laughs> Yeah, this person looks familiar. She, is that Guinan, but with glasses on? What's going on? <laughs> the technological differences are kind of interesting in the thing in this, even though they're completely unnecessary for the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't do, they don't really do anything with it. But also, they often do run into people who can't threaten them at all. It's just not remarked on unless it's irrelevant for some reason. <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> that's that's a big part of the show, the Enterprise as the 1980s and 90s American stand-in is the unchallenged superpower of the universe, and almost nothing can touch it. So you know, uh, having that uh, you know difference there is you know it uh, you know it does crop up, but I guess having it be so I guess explicit here is kind of what I you know uh, you know trying to draw a circle mm. around. You know, it's uh, you know more implied usually uh though there are a couple other episodes that sort of touch upon this as well specifically that one where they uh, all lose their memory and they're like oh we're at war with these people so let's go fight them oh they seem to be really easy to explode yeah why haven't we Hmm. crushed them already if this is what's happening yeah Hmm, something seems off here but yeah i like what they're trying to do with okana it's kind of fun it's fun to have the little like space rogue character and it's also kind of nice to do the this is a better version of it than what they had in original series because obviously this is like a mud style like indeed outside of the federation all is star wars and buck rogers for some reason and uh and so you can you know once you sort of get away from the uh, the federation the uh, things get wild things get crazy you can have a guy that you know living his life like he, he just feels like it and does what he wants and all that cool stuff man and i do like that he's like they don't trust him specifically but uh they don't dislike him he's mm-hmm. fine and no one hates what he's doing he can want to have sex with lots of people who are actually into it and interested and it's not a problem mm-hmm like, they said that, that Mud having sex with people wasn't a problem, but that's more because they didn't think sexually assaulting people was a problem in the 60s. Yeah. Well, in this case, it's a little more uh, obviously consensual. Yeah. Hmm, but what would Okanda do with a bunch of androids? I don't know. Probably engage them in some sort of discussion about how they can have sex, but they wouldn't enjoy it, because that's what he did immediately upon meeting Data. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then there'd be a joke about uh, birds. Um. <laughs> and I do like the actor, and I think he does a good job playing Okana as that kind of like lovable rogue character. Now, I have uh, seen some critiques of this episode that we are more told than shown that he's kind of the scamp character. But uh, with the you know the sleeping around side of, uh, uh, sort of stuff there, uh, that's I guess sort of demonstrating at least 
part of that sort of, I guess, vibe. Otherwise, you know, it's like, well, he's a traitor and he moves things from place to place and he's in trouble because these two, you know, windbag, uh, you know, dad uh, characters say he is as opposed to he's actually really done anything. Well, it's implied so, that he doesn't, yeah. that he hasn't really done anything bad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, you can see this kind of dynamic in other places. He's like, he's the go-between between between the two nations that don't particularly like each other. So neither one particularly trust him because he's not falling into their jingoistic ideas of state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's uh, doing his independent thing, which I guess in terms of the, uh, the, you know, the Federation view uh, slash Starfleet specifically to a degree, they're all uh, part of Starfleet because they have chosen to be there. They are a, a professional force of volunteers after all. And so, uh, you know, having someone volunteer to do something else entirely, that's kind of like, they're like, just thumbs up. It's like, yeah, mm. you do you. You could actually look at the outside of the Federation things like this as an interesting contrast. They never really bring it up, but it's implied mm -hmm. that like Okana's ship is breaking down and he doesn't have the necessary means to keep it in working order because outside of the Federation, people are still engaging in capitalism. And you can see just how dangerous and unviable a spacefaring civilization that's still using capitalist ideas becomes. Because every time you run into someone who's still trying to do space capitalism, their ship is seconds from falling apart and killing everyone on it. Indeed. And I guess the only exception to that is the Fringi, but, you know, they're not well-defined at this point. Yeah, they're not, they, the on, Fringi yeah. aren't yet space capitalists. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they're they're Yankee traders that might be capitalists. <laughs> so far, they're more in the uh, we're going to steal your stuff and like try to you know give back stuff. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I think they could have leaned. It would have been interesting if they leaned into the uh, if they'd leaned into the Romeo and Juliet thing a little more because mm -hmm. it's actually it's not a bad idea. Like Romeo and Juliet, but from the perspective of the priest is not a bad idea. <laughs> like, what was the go-between doing this whole time? How did people feel about him as an instigator? Yeah, I, I suppose in the the, uh, the original text, you know, it's like, well, it's a, a priest character. That's somebody that everyone kind of knows, and because they're a priest, they're supposed to, like, have a minimum level of respect and, you know, let them do their own thing because they got church stuff to do. Mm. But, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean people don't have feelings about them. Uh, especially if they're, you know, in your business some way. Yeah, and this one, it makes, this actually makes a bit more sense that, like, the person who is enabling the two warring families' children to even know each other at all is um, not someone that they're going to like. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, stand tough against our uh, opposition, and, you know, we can't show a moment of weakness. And don't you dare talk to them without official channels and my approval. Of course, obviously, it's a bad idea for you to just randomly steal the family heirlooms. Like, even if you're the child, that's good. That starts yeah. wars. <laughs> yeah, it might it'd be maybe a good idea for Benson to have, like, told his dad. It's like, you know, I'm thinking about getting married. Uh, I'm going to hold on to the jewel here now. Don't start any wars over this, please. I need this for reasons. Yeah. But, you know, I guess being like a teenager, uh, I guess he didn't think that far ahead. That is true. It, look, they need to be dumb teenagers in order for it to work, which they are yeah. in this. <laughs> which, I, you know, works. <laughs> that's part of the, that's part of what makes sense as the Okana character, more so than like the priest character. Because why is the priest in Romeo and Juliet helping them, apart from the fact that he <laughs> needs to for plot reasons? Okana yes. <laughs> is shown as that kind of character who never stopped being a teenage boy. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, is two want to like hook up and get married? Cool, I'll, I'll support that. You know, plus he's probably getting paid, but obviously not enough if his ship is falling apart. Hmm. Yeah. And um, our benzen, pay your pay your uh uh secret fairy or priest character, but more, <laughs> please. I think that actually they did do they did a lot of actual like good subtle character building with Okana to show him as the lovable rogue character. The, he's perpetually yeah. horny, which we already associate with the yes. lovable rogue character. But the way that he's helping out the two kids for, like, his ship's falling apart. He's obviously a loner. He's obviously working to scrape by barely in this weird little spacefaring capitalist society they seem to have. 
but he's also very obviously helping out these two teenagers because he wants to and out of the goodness of his heart because he doesn't do anything wrong here he doesn't steal the jewel and sell it he's mm-hmm. not making money off of this he's just doing it because he likes to and he believes in love yeah, i suppose he could be uh carrying uh you know other uh cargo along the way to sort of you know cover up what he's up to um but we don't really care about any of that because it's not relevant to the two dads they're feuding yeah you know you i'm going to ferry you two to your secret rendezvous just mind the drugs yes <laughs> what is this blue crystal stuff uh don't touch that <laughs> this looks like a lentil <laughs> hmm future drugs hey uh, 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 uh where's sunny uh, yeah i know he's last season but maybe he'd be in all this you remember sunny right <laughs> Which one was Sonny? Who was Sonny? Uh, he was the uh, country music guy that was frozen. Oh, right. Yeah, that's Sonny. <laughs> that episode leaves so little impact on me. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, he and uh, O'Connor should team up sometime. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that he hasn't gotten a callback. Hey, prodigy people, get on it. It seems like the kind of thing that would do lower, de- lower decks. I think we said that at the time. In the- <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, um, it's Romeo and Juliet in space from the perspective of the priest, and they don't really do anything particularly transformative with any part of it. And they got a bad comedian to come on and ad-lib bad jokes that is only saved by the fact that Brent Spiner is an amazing comedian. Mm-hmm. And uh, kind of, you know, one-ups Joe Piscopo anytime they're together. <laughs> so oh, I, I do uh, appreciate uh, Piscopo wasn't the only one uh, going, wow, these jokes suck. Apparently, uh, Whoopi Goldberg was also like, All right, I'm going to like do some modifications here uh, because, wow. I do think it's kind of interesting looking at the modern landscape of you know comedy. The s- conceit of that part of the episode is someone needs to you know be good at telling jokes or people aren't going to laugh mm-hmm. at it. And that's kind of a back and forth that you have as the person trying to learn humor. Instead of, I told a joke and no one laughed, that must mean that they hate me and are offended by my existence and I should rant about it. And uh, we don't want to go that way, especially with the, uh, you know, you know uh, data because it wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> Data could be very angry that no one gets his jokes, and he's probably being canceled or something. <laughs> but uh, he has no emotion, but he's angry anyway. What? How does this work? <laughs> oh, he's doing it for clout. I got it. <laughs> yeah, you don't need real emotions to be angry like that. <laughs> so I guess in terms of uh, you know uh, so people to play off of uh, the uh, you know Data could have been teamed up with O'Connor to a uh, certain degree, of course. But O'Connor's kind of busy for this entire episode with various other plots. So I guess who of the uh, main uh, cast, if it, if not Guinan, could he have really sort of had this back and forth with? Uh, Crusher, uh, well, Wesley is uh, still kind of young, and so maybe his form of humor wouldn't have made sense even to other people in the fiction. Mm-hmm. Troy... Could have maybe told some Beta Z jokes, but th- those would probably not hit either. Worf is a, uh, is a great deadpan Starker, but you know sometimes that's a little too subtle for folks. I would folks. have loved them to do like Klingon jokes. Yes, like that. <laughs> like the you could have had like the the star the Stargate scene where Tilk tells the classic Jaffa Rob joke. Set. <laughs> yeah, Jaffa jokes. <laughs> you know the uh, serpent guard's eyes. Uh, you know tr- uh, twinkle or whatever. The uh, the uh, the uh, 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 Horus guard's beak it flashes, and uh, the, the the set guard's nose drips. <laughs> Jordy's not really known for his humor. No, not really. Picard, Picard, it might he, he might have. I don't know, pulled some Shakespeare to really kind of underline the <laughs> main plot, I guess. But I guess that kind of le- leaves Riker. And in fact, I guess Riker's kind of missing from large sections of this episode. Yeah, because right. he would compete with O'Connor. Yeah, which maybe that's what he was doing this episode. <laughs> competing with O'Connor? Probably. Yes. I'm going to take, yeah, Riker is in the background taking advantage of the general vibe of horniness going on on the ship. Yes. <laughs> Go for it, uh, uh, you know, Riker. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, this plot doesn't involve you very much, so you got some free time. Have fun. So, 
with, with Fracker busy, that means it's, it's down to Gein and only is like anyone who makes any sense at all. Uh, unless, wait, Pulaski doesn't show up with this episode at all, actually. Yeah, that's one of the things. Let's, this is an episode that could be in any season because there's no doctor. Yes. So, uh, you know, I guess uh, could also have like Beverly Crasher just show up for no reason. <laughs> I really just like the idea of everyone sharing humor and Wesley being into whatever the far future version of TikTok humor is. Yes. And no one <laughs> understands. <laughs> that could have been quite amusing. I've been noticing that as like I'm trying to I'm trying to remember that this is just something that happens as the people around you get younger. But I see the mm-hmm. stuff that that kids are doing as humor and it's like I know just enough to recognize that this is a joke, but I don't know yes. enough about the context of the humor to understand the joke. Mhm. Yeah, I I do my best to keep up with the the times and these th- sorts of things, but yeah, there's still plenty of that like I don't get it. But well, that's okay. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you're having fun. Is my general yeah. vibe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I guess that's maybe something you know. I you know we can encourage our audience as well. It's like there is going to be a time when you run into lots of you know humor, jokes, and things like that, and cultural cut touchstones that you are just completely baffled by. But that's okay. That's just part of living. Sometimes you find yourself in a situation where you are disconnected from what's going on, and you don't get it. And that's okay. Yeah. You don't have to be with it all the time. You could be with it in your own way. This actually reminds me of uh, a bit of uh, humor from Babylon 5, actually. I think it was the fifth season episode, um, Day of the Dead. Uh, They actually have uh, Penn and Teller come on as uh, in-world comedians. And they do a bit of their stand-up uh, routine for uh, you know folks at a party or something like that. And the jokes make absolutely no sense <laughs> intentionally because <laughs> this is the future. So all the, you know, it's again, cultural touchstones that they're you know using as leverage to build their humor are things that are completely beyond us because we have not experienced them. And so all this nonsense they start spewing, that's the humor of the future, and us not getting it, that's fine. See, that's an interesting way to go. Mm-hmm. I don't think uh, Star Trek was quite ready to pull something like that in this episode, but maybe further down the line. I mean, it's brave to go, to lean in that far, because most science fiction, Star Trek included, to keep your to keep any understandability with your modern audience, all culture stopped in the 90s. Anything that happened since then? Well, it's just a fever dream and something those new kids are up to these days. Don't worry about it. It's going to be a fad. Yeah. It's going to go away soon. Well, it's just the... Uh, I don't know. It's It works in a lot of things. It's like that thing with... It was an interesting thing that I saw about Marvel like comic book continuity and, and their timelines. Which is like, this thing happened a few years ago. Yeah. Yep. Captain America <laughs> was unthawed from the glacier originally in like the 70s, but in every comic it was a few years back. Yep. <laughs> and you know, just sort of an elastic timeline, so everything yeah. just kind of can fit together and you can have the uh, the super science of the 60s becomes real the 90s and so both are very much just a few years ago and it's fine. <laughs> Star Trek does it the other direction where you know we are a few years from creating the like near future apocalypse of DS9. We're always a couple of years out from from that like prelude to the Third World War. So you know, watch out for that. But you know, until then, uh, we can think about the stuff that happens afterwards, and it's cool stuff, guys. Yeah, we're not gonna get there. It's fine. Yeah, we'll all die. <laughs> I just someone the other day had a had a thing pointing out that that the Star Trek future st- didn't start with cool space travel. It started with ending world hunger. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. It's like, Oh, uh, you know, all right. So the, the Vulcans are here. Um, but you know, we're still in a post apocalyptic sort of hell hole on here on earth. Uh, maybe we should like fix things. And so like even enterprise is like, yeah, we're just kind of still barely getting out of our own solar system here a century later. <laughs> Because, you know, we had to, like, fix all our problems back on Earth first. Yeah. We can't go from uh, where we are now to that to that thing without doing a lot of other changes. You don't get to space and suddenly everything's fixed. Yes. And, you know, if that was true, then we would have already been, you know, 
there i guess you get to space without out. fixing stuff yeah. that's how you wind up in mass effect you don't want to be in mass effect <laughs> unfortunately i don't know enough about the lore of mass effect to make a joke at this point <laughs> There's still obviously space capitalism. 90% of who you run into in that game are nameless mercenaries who are being hired by various evil corporations and criminals to kill each other. <laughs> well, uh, I guess there's going to be a lot of dead people in space then yep. in that future. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that sucks. So uh, before we get uh, too distracted, uh, is there anything about the, the theory of humor you want to talk about? Uh, that's too big of a thing. Um, actually, where was that? I think that if you want to look at an interesting thing about the about the theory of humor, the uh, YouTube channel Chill Goblin did something recently about humor and how it's being how why conservatives are not funny and how people who should know what they're doing have started not. <laughs> It's a like three hour long video, so I'm not going to be able to act, to cover anything about the theory of humor in three minutes. You know, yeah. I guess uh, one of the things I uh, you know generally notice with folks that are trying and failing at humor, but still get a chuckle out of you know a certain part of their audience anyway, is that they're attempting some sort of in joke, but even then, it's more of a there's an expectation to laugh at it because you know that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> as opposed to it actually being funny. <laughs> I was watching through some older shows, and uh, they're funny. I like them. Like, some of the humor holds up, some doesn't. But then there was one thing that was like the introduction to a clip show episode, and suddenly the main guy was talking, doing his little bit, but there was no laugh track over it because it was just mm -hmm. a quickie intro recording that they'd done. And it was like, I actually can't tell which of these are supposed to be jokes without the laugh track indeed now uh i've uh been to uh stand-up uh comedy stuff uh in person before uh and you know if there was no audience there it would honestly be kind of tricky sometimes to sort of find myself in the moment of the humor so yeah there's definitely a i guess not quite a peer pressure sort of thing there but a a, a cue moment that uh yeah, it was mm -hmm. kind of useful for that sort of uh, you know presentation sometimes. But I think it's fine because we've gone from you know we've gone from this shit with Joe Piscopo coming on to be the comedian in one episode to uh, Tignataro just being on Discovery. Is mm -hmm. <laughs> a much better comedian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, you know, I think you're. Uh, why am I not remembering the, the name of the character? Uh, not, uh, Reno. Uh, Reno, I think, is probably my favorite character mm -hmm. on Discovery. <laughs> Just like, yeah, yeah, not in every episode, but when you show up, it usually means there's going to be something that's going to be hilarious and very deadpan at the same time. It's just just wonderful. Yeah, because you got an actually good comedian to come on and do your stuff instead of whatever this was. Yes. <laughs> An attempt... Was it made in this episode? No, not even a little bit. <laughs> um, and, you know, I guess we haven't even touched upon some of the uh, the, the baffling sort of bits of the, the comedy, but, you know, also, you know, a briefcase looks like a fish, and then Data saying it's an amphibian. But yeah, <laughs> that's more nitpicky as opposed to, like, actually critiquing what's going on. Because, you know, as you said before, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, improv going on here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're just improv sometimes, you know, stuff like that gets through. And maybe they did several takes and different sort of ways to go about it. And this was the best one. Yeah. Just maybe a little scary. I mean, you could just be saying an amphibious briefcase because the briefcase is on land, but it looks like it should be in the water. Yes. <laughs> Which is maybe the best way to go about it. Yeah, the... the this is not a bad episode, and if they cut out the uh, the stupid comedy subplot and let the other characters have a little bit more development, it probably could have been pretty pretty nicely done as a Romeo and Juliet in space. Mm -hmm. But no, we needed our stupid mm. comedy side plot for some reason. Yeah, because uh, apparently Romeo and Juliet, Juliet wasn't long enough for a Star Trek episode. Yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe one of the reasons <laughs> that Riker wasn't in this episode is because Campbell was on the short list for being Riker. <laughs> oh, you know, feeling jealous. <laughs> no, like, well, we can't have the two characters. They're too similar. 
<laughs> they both have beards. That's that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's really all I got. Uh, you got anything else you no, want to talk about? No, that's it. That's that's the only thing. Wait, I'm surprised we got this far. Honestly, yeah. Well, that's fine. There's so uh, many filler yeah. episodes at the end of this season. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I guess you know we we can I guess think forward to the uh, the rest of the season and you know some of the uh, the future episodes like Shades of Grey. Yeah, we'll have so much to talk about then. The Royale on Samaritan Snare. <laughs> the Royale, at least, is interesting enough to slightly remember. <laughs> <laughs> Although there are, there are some other episodes I actually rather like later in this season. It just, you know, they're kind of speckled in between episodes. They're like, okay, we're here. Mm-hmm. Like, up the long ladder. I mean, that one's not bad, yeah. <laughs> well, it also has features the... Uh, Irrational Irish stereotypes nonsense that Star Trek likes to do sometimes. And there's also some other weird plots about like bodily autonomy and such going oh, on. Oh, yeah, here we're gonna have kind a lot of, to talk about yeah. with Up the Long Ladder. There's some weird yeah. shit happening in that episode <laughs> that you're just yeah. supposed to mindlessly agree with. So, yeah, we got that stuff to look yeah. forward to. So, but anyway, for now, yeah. we're done with Okana until he shows up in several later series because they suddenly remembered a character existed. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> that means that it's time for the galaxy's favorite game show! Hey everybody, welcome to the galaxy's favorite game show. Today we got a few, uh, of our, uh, you know, usual as well as unusual uh, you know, contestants, and they've been racking up various points and trying to win the prizes. So let's get started with TV Love Story, which goes to these uh, those youngsters, those scamps. Even though this plot is centuries old, it predates TV, and thus TV lo- Love Story is also a stage play love story, I guess. Anyway, what do they win, Gapwin? They win... Some nice wedding presents like a rose, dagger, a bottle full of something you probably shouldn't drink. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, some reconciliation between their, their families, perhaps. Yeah. Maybe. That'd be nice. <laughs> Our second prize is the Humor Gap Prize, which goes to Data, O'Connor, and the comic for all being out of touch in their various ways with the humor needs of the future. Uh, that, sorry, O'Connor, but that joke about the birds and the uh, the pigeons or whatever it was it, it doesn't land and wesley being baffled by it that's that's my reaction too sorry um yeah what do they win gap i mean maybe that lands really really well we just don't have the proper cultural context with it because we need another 300 years mm-hmm. that is a possibility but i'm not 300 years older gap maybe someday they win what i know wouldn't work out because of the time periods and stuff but we're going to switch out the holographic comedian for Carrot Top, because I think Data could definitely learn some prop comedy. Indeed. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, the comic does, you know, it's like, oh, we're not, let's uh, bypass the uh, the physical comedy here. But no, let's let's keep on with it. But, you know, just do a different routine. Get the props out, you know, and uh, we're going to have some fun here. It's going to be good times. Then, then he just shows up in 10 forward and it's like, I have a joke. And just pulls out a rubber chicken with a hat. Ha. <laughs> Guy looks at him kind of baffled, but then just kind of starts snickering. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Was that funny? Um, I think so, but I, I don't know why. <laughs> Our final prize is the Wonderful Hostage Prize, which goes to Guinan and Wesley for not being offended by the lame jokes tossed their way to the point of violence. So they were wonderful about being their, uh, themselves uh, the hostage audience, and uh, I guess they could also toss the, uh, the holographic audience in there, too, uh, to a certain degree. What do they all win, Gepwin? They win a holodeck recording of Whippy Goldberg doing stand-up so that Guinan can take Wesley to the holodeck and go like, let me show you something that's actually funny. Excellent. I look forward to that. Uh, maybe we'll uh, have a, a Star Trek special for it someday on this show. Maybe. The future! All right, that's everything. Thank you very much for dealing with, with our weird, weird shit today. <laughs> on our, the Galaxy's Favorite Game Show. <laughs> Woo! 
Oh, the next episode is not good. It's not. It's not. It's so not. It's... I I have some maybe some different feelings about it. I kind of like some of it. Um, but there are other things that I'm like, that's a little baffling. This, um, it's trying. I can say that yeah. it's trying. It doesn't do it well. But it's it is trying the the main act the main guest star actor that they brought in like was like pushed for it to be better got some things in did change it a bit from how bad it was going to be but they still aren't doing well yeah uh the 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 guest actor uh is himself deaf and this episode uh revolves around uh you know uh, you know you know deafness and you know interacting with people. Uh, and the tools that he uses at the beginning are not present there, and even though they're people, I guess. But it's it's a weird sort of thing, I yeah. guess. Um, but uh, it is a uh, you know an episode where you know that's sort of a essential sort of uh, plot element here. And you know he likes you know it's like I want this episode to exist for for starters, and it to be the best sort of thing we can sort of do that both showcases that deaf people are like people, for for instance. But also, you know, that they can do things and you're not just going to be like, you know, you're deaf and thus useless. Yeah. That kind of crap. So the next episode is called Loud as a Whisper. It is the one where they have a deaf mediator have to go to deal with the unstable thing on a planet that's been at war for thousands of years. And uh, yeah, thank like just something easy. The ghost of the original plot is still in here, which I think causes problems, even though. Uh, the actor who they brought in was able to convince them to change it to be more deaf positive than it was originally going to be. It was going to be very, very ableist in the original draft. But oh I don't think they changed enough to like get rid of the little vein of stuff that's running through this episode overall. Uh, there, there's still a, a kind of awkward moment where like Picard like grabs his head as he talks loud at him. Yes. Yeah. Calm down, Picard. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. That's that's not helping at all. Like yelling at people seldom as helpful as you think it's going to be. And it's it's much less so when they're actually deaf. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So anyway, loud as a whisper, right? Hmm. I mean, I do like it because during that we'll look at this. So during that scene, the stuff that he's signing is like, like screw you. This isn't about you. Fuck off. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Anyway, yes, next time, loud as a whisper, we'll have some actual things to talk about because they're trying to do something for once. Yay. Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow, Picard talks loudly. You have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbeam, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcasts, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more. And where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on YouTube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Isix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Isix, and Twitter at IsixLP. Music is Waveform and Mori's Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, Please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs>